And let me say this. Talk to me. I think people who are saying that I have to wait till I get to a certain revenue amount, mm -hmm. if you have HR in the beginning, you're going to be able to reach that revenue amount a lot faster and you're mm -hmm. going to be able to overcome a lot of the pitfalls that you might encounter if you don't incorporate HR. On For now. one, a lot of business owners, especially entrepreneurs, spend money like crazy. Mm -hmm. They don't have a rhyme or reason to it. It's just like, yo, I'm paying this person three grand. I'm paying this person this. Mm -hmm. If you had HR, you'd establish pay bans. You'd understand like salary, the the salary compensation or the, the national averages that are applicable for that particular region. Mm -hmm. And then you apply that and you adopt a pay philosophy for oh, your yeah. company. But if you're just spending money with no rhyme or reason, how are you really going to say that this is going to be the amount of money I'm going to make in a certain amount of time? Because you don't really know how you're doing that. There's no strategy behind it. Come on now. Come you know on what now. I mean? So I'm just saying, like, you say you want to get HR when you get a certain amount of money. If you start with HR, we can get to that amount of money faster. Come I'm on. just saying. The biggest risk that most entrepreneurs take is trying to build a successful business without funding. But what if I told you that risk doesn't have to be your reality just by you having access to the right information? What's going on family? My name is Marvin Francois and just a couple of years ago, I was a new entrepreneur trying to turn my dreams of building a successful business into a reality. Now, once I learned that the key to me doing so was accessing business credit, I accessed the funding I needed, leveraged it to build multiple six-figure businesses, and I haven't looked back since. And now, I want to give you the exact blueprint that I used to do this so that you could do the same for your business as well. So this Thursday, I'm going to be hosting my free Bankroll Your Business Masterclass, where I'm going to be teaching you how to access a minimum of $50,000 in funding, whether you have good credit, bad credit, or no credit, so that you can take that funding to build the business of your dreams. But listen, we only have 100 seats, and by the time you watch this video, about half of them are going to be gone. So if you haven't already, click the link above or below this video to secure your seat and I'll see you on Thursday. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, this is the Marvin Francois Show, your number one source for all things business, finance, and investing. And today huh, is a very special day because our guest today is a human resources specialist with nearly two decades of experience in business development, startups, mergers, acquisitions, and leadership development training, both domestically and abroad. To some, he's the chief HR strategist for Earn Your Leisure University. To others, He's a global business consultant, but at the root of it all, he's your company's secret weapon for people, infrastructure, and strategy. And today, he's here to give you all the game you need for your business to succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with the one, the only, Mr. Brandon Nelson, a.k.a. Being the HR guy. What's going on, family? How are you? Nothing much, man. Thank you for having me. Listen, thank you for coming on down all the way from Cali, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little hot. Yeah. You know, Atlanta, we, we we are humid out here, but I'm here. Happy to be here. Listen, Invest Fest weekend. I feel like I feel like from what I see on Instagram, you're in Atlanta. If not every week, it's like every other week, just working. Yeah. It's just, become, Atlanta's becoming a second home. Seriously. Becoming a second becoming a second home. But yeah. even even still, your heart is in Cali. You're locked in there. Ain't that no way fans are buzz about it. It's always gonna be home. But listen, we're live, we're here, Invest Folks Weekend. Excited to have you, excited to get connected with you. Yeah. Um, I've been watching you from afar for so, so long, and I've had people in trucking come on here. I've had people in real estate come on here. I've had people in credit in so many different fields, but never have I ever had somebody who specializes in the behind the scenes of business mm -hmm. come on here and really break down the game for my guests because, you know, we see on social media, the glitz and the glamour and the flashy cars and, yeah. you know, the, the striped deposits and all these different things. But there's another side to what it takes to build a successful business that you specialize in. And I said, listen, I'd be remiss if I ain't have you come on here and give the game on top of game on top of game for my people. So yeah. we're going to get into it. But before we do, I think I did a I did an OK job introducing you. Right. But nobody mm -hmm. knows being the HR guy better than being the HR guy himself. So for those who don't know, let the people know who is Brandon Nelson. So Brandon Nelson, myself, HR professional for more than 15 years now. I grew up always knowing that I was going to be of service to people. Mm -hmm. And I studied marketing as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a natural creative person. So I knew I was going to be designing commercials and just being on the creative end of things. But those opportunities just didn't open up. So I was pursuing my master's at the time and getting ready to decide on an emphasis. And I had to go back to the drawing board and really just figure out what was going to work for me. And at that time, I was working in HR. Mm -hmm. I then kind of went back and just explored my whole trajectory up to that point, And it had been everything HR. 
So I just decided to make it official. So mm-hmm. I pursued my MBA in human resources. And from that point, my career just took off. So I started as a recruiter. I then went into more employee relations, more strategic HR. I got a chance to work with several companies on the international side of things. So I was really heavy involved in employment law. So just understanding what red tape to stay away from for companies. Right. And from that point, I continued to blossom in the on the management side and literally just continued to grow and grow. I ultimately achieved my ultimate goal of being VP of HR, head wow. of HR for a publicly traded cannabis company. Mm-hmm. And then when COVID hit, I ended up being able to pivot and start my own consulting company. Very, very dope. And that door opened and I have not looked back. Right. And you've been crushing it and killing it since. So Try from, it, man. So from there, where did how did the transition, if you feel comfortable talking about it, mm-hmm. happen to where, you know, like you said, you were once working with a publicly traded cannabis company mm-hmm. to now um working with EYL University. That's 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 a big step, right? <laughs> how did that come about? So I Marcus Barney is my client. Very and dope. so I've been working with him for almost four years now. Mm-hmm. And so he and I have done a lot in terms of infrastructure building and really building up recession proof mm-hmm. in terms of its foundation and putting all of those particular components of the business in place. And he then was given an opportunity to merge with e- EYL. Mm-hmm. So I was brought to the table to kind of merge the two together and figure out how we would be able to take these two individually sound, strong powerhouses right. and merge them into one. Right. So it started with conversations and the way that those guys work is like, hey, we got to make this happen and it moves quick. Right. And so from that point, we were able to put, I would say, the game plan together and mm-hmm. then I was able to just kind of help them execute. And we were able to seamlessly put that together. And so we now have EYL University powered by Recession Proof. Beautiful, beautiful. So now let's provide some context to people, right? Because mm-hmm. I, like I myself as an entrepreneur, like other entrepreneurs, I've heard of mm-hmm. human resources. And I think a lot of other people have also heard about human resources themselves as well. But I don't think really a lot of people truly understand what human resources is, what it entails, and why it's so imperative to the growth and the development, right? And the mm-hmm. structure of a business. So you yourself being a specialist in the space, right? For mm-hmm. as much time as you have, really break it down for people who don't know what exactly is human resources and why is it so important to business businesses and business owners? Got it. So human resources is really the 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 practice of people's well-being. Okay. So it is the heart of a business because mm-hmm. it's it pretty much monitors not only what your employees do, who they are, and how they operate within the business. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of companies only think that HR is just hiring and firing, Mm -hmm. but HR really creates and captive, it it creates the culture of the business. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to having all of those elements in place, you got to think about it. If a company is going to prosper, if they're going to be successful, all of those elements have to be in place. And human resources is the one that's orchestrating that. We're behind the scenes. And a lot of people don't realize how many areas of the business that we really touch. Right. So it's, I always say that, hey, we're that secret weapon because we're behind the scenes. You don't always see us, but we put it in work. Mm-hmm. So for example, when you see a CEO that might be falling off or their their focus isn't where it needs to be, you usually have an HR professional that's behind them that's speaking into their ear like, hey, this is an area that I'm pinpointing that needs to be addressed immediately. Let's make sure we get to that. Mm-hmm. So it's, if you have that absence in the business, it, it kind of, you you really feel it. So right. I think HR is one of those, those things that's not celebrated, but I think now people are starting to become more aware of just how powerful it is as a, a function in the business. Right. I would say to that point, I think the reason why HR isn't celebrated is because it's not sexy, right? Like ideally when, like I said, when people think about business, especially in this information age that we're in, mm-hmm. we only want to talk about what can I do to make some money, right? Yep. But the name of the game isn't just making the money. It's about keeping the money and staying in business as well. Mm -hmm. And to your point, HR plays such a pivotal role in that Mm -hmm. um, in making sure that we have a sustainable business now and forevermore. Mm -hmm. I guess a follow-up question that I would have to that is, you know, like you said, right now, you working with the likes of a Marcus Barney and of an EYO University. Ideally, when a bit, what point does a business need to get to in order for it to know like, okay, we got to go ahead and start putting HR together. Is it a certain dollar amount in revenue? Is it a certain amount of personnel? Is it 
Um, is it something we get started from day one, right? Talk to yeah. me a little bit about that because I think that's also important context for the audience as well. So I'm glad you asked that question. When it comes to having HR, every business, whether you're a solopreneur or really? if you have 10,000 customers mm -hmm. or 10,000 employees, you should have HR. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the misconceptions that we have is that I have to get to a certain point before I initiate HR. And that's just horrible thinking. It's really HR should start at the infancy stages of your business. Mm -hmm. It should be incorporated in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. But I would say it's not a dollar amount, but it's really how you establish your infrastructure when it comes to understanding the mission, the vision, the core values of your company, what you're aspiring to accomplish for your customers. Mm -hmm. All of those things that you're pretty much crafting out those are HR elements. Right. So a lot of businesses think that, oh, well, I don't need to have someone in because I don't have employees that I have to manage on a daily basis. And it's like, okay, well, that's one element of HR, which mm -hmm. again, they think all we do is hire and fire. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to really crafting and building a business, that's the other side of HR that people are now starting to become familiar with. Mm -hmm. But you start that early. It doesn't matter how many employees you have. I love it. I love it. That was important context for me too, because like I said, my preconceived notion was, okay, I need to be making a certain amount of money in revenue at, at a certain point for me to even think about HR. But you're saying, no, no, no. From day one, mm -hmm. you have to get that information structure set up if you're trying to build a long-term and a sustainable business. 100%. And let me say this. Talk to me. I think people who are saying that I have to wait till I get to a certain revenue amount, mm -hmm. if you have HR in the beginning, you're going to be able to reach that revenue amount a lot faster and you're mm -hmm. going to be able to overcome a lot of the pitfalls that you might encounter if you don't incorporate HR. On For now. one, a lot of business owners, especially entrepreneurs, spend money like crazy. Mm -hmm. They don't have a rhyme or reason to it. It's just like, yo, I'm paying this person three grand. I'm paying this person this. Mm -hmm. If you had HR, you'd establish pay bans. You'd understand like salary, the the salary compensation or the, the national averages that are applicable for that particular region. Mm -hmm. And then you apply that and you adopt a pay philosophy for oh, your yeah. company. But if you're just spending money with no rhyme or reason... How are you really going to say that this is going to be the amount of money I'm going to make in a certain amount of time? Because you don't really know how you're doing that. There's no strategy behind it. Come on now. Come you know on what now. I mean? So I'm just saying like, you say you want to get HR when you get a certain amount of money. If you start with HR, we can get to that amount of money faster. Come I'm on. Just saying. I'm come just saying. on. You're getting me excited, brother. Yeah, bro, like, let, me, let, me, let me sit up. I forgot who you brought on this episode. <laughs> Listen, we're going to... I want, and that's exactly why I was so excited to bring you on here and break this thing down because my goal is just to provide as much value as I can to new and or aspiring entrepreneurs through this platform. And I'm, I'm looking at the likes of you and I'm like, man, I'm doing my community a huge, huge disservice if I'm not breaking this aspect of the business down. Because wow. yeah. you just broke down a huge misconception. Like I'm sure like myself, there are a lot of other people that are tuning into this episode that thought like, hey... I got to get to this amount and then I can consider HR. You're saying if you want to get to this amount, you got to consider, not even consider, you need to get HR set up now because mm -hmm. there are probably a lot of holes in your business that you're not able to see that an HR specialist like a BN, the HR guy can come in and say, hey, mm -hmm. we got to fix this, 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 and this, right? Mm -hmm. So let's really break this down for people and let's, let's start off talking about structure, which you yeah. start, start to really get into, right? One of my personal favorite sayings in business is you cannot delegate what you haven't done, Yeah. right? And for me, um, I think about when I think about that, I think about SOPs, which I would love to talk about with you, because mm -hmm. um, obviously, as we're looking to build a successful business, eventually we want to get to a point where we can start bringing people in. Yeah. Right. But before we bring those people in, we need things like SOPs to ensure that these individuals that we're bringing into our company know exactly what needs to be done, mm -hmm. how it needs to be done, mm -hmm. why it needs to be done and making sure that it's getting done as efficiently and as effectively as possible. So. Uh, let's take some time to break that down for the audience. Uh, when we talk about SOPs, for those who don't know, could you please explain what an SOP is and why it's so essential to the structuring of a business? Absolutely. So SOPs are standard operating procedures, mm -hmm. and those are pretty much it's a document that you put in place so that your employees know what to do. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm going to take it a step further and break it down a, li a little more. When I have clients, I have SOPs, but then I also have WIs, which are called work instructions. Because an SOP tells you what to do, work instructions tell you how to do it. Mm. So a lot of people, if you overgeneralize things, then it's you can't really have an expectation for a certain performance outcome. 
Right. And so when you're bringing your employees on, it's important to have your SOPs because those are all of the procedures within your business. But when it comes to training and you want that person to execute in a certain manner, you really have to have work instructions. The work instructions are going to take you from A to Z on how to execute that specific task. Mm. And those are important to a business because when you think about it, when you were onboarded to any particular company, if you just sit down in front of your computer at your desk and they tell you, okay, go and be great. <laughs> that's and but that's the reality of a lot of companies out here right Crazy. now. Okay. And so for me, I want to sit you down. First off, your onboarding is gonna be fire. Come I need now. you to have a, a a party. We want you to know how important you are to this company, the what you're gonna bring to the table, but also what we're gonna give you. And look, we want you to know exactly how we want you to perform at our company. This is how we welcome our customers. Here's a full-on script on how to do it. This is the system that we use for our CRM. Here are all of the steps on how to access all of the menus. This is how we save. This is how you access our database. All of those things. So you have SOPs, which is given the general overview, and you have work instructions so they know exactly how you want them to execute. Come on now. I didn't even... I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. I mean, I'm getting excited. I didn't even know. I thought it was just SOPs. I, I mean, know about no WIs. Listen. Listen, we bringing in a couple other consonants and vowels into this equation. I love it. This is exciting. Hey, from A to Z. A to Z. Come you on now. be thorough. Come on now. So, so we understand the importance of SOPs. And now, like I said, I'm even learning about WIs. I didn't know about this. How can I go about creating? If I'm a new entrepreneur that's listening to this, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I ain't got no SOPs. Yeah. I got to go get these SOPs set up. How can I go about creating SOPs and creating WIs mm -hmm. for my business to start? What would you recommend? So use AI. It okay. is the best tool of life. So mm -hmm. chat GPT all day. Okay. So I would recommend if you are a new entrepreneur or if you're a new small business owner and you're looking to establish SOPs, use prompt engineering. Mm -hmm. So you are going to go to chat GPT, you're going to open it up and you're going to say, act as a business owner. Give me a, a name of a company. Give me a company. Uh, Nike. Nike. So act as a business owner of Nike, a shoe brand. Establish SOPs for welcoming a customer and entering customer information into a database. Mm -hmm. That's the prompt that you're going to put into chat GPT. Mm -hmm. It's then going to create the SOP for you. Mm -hmm. All you're going to have to do as the business owner is review it to make sure that it makes sense for you. But you're going to get that in literally 30 seconds mm -hmm. and you're going to spend another five minutes with editing it. Editing it mm -hmm. And in 10 minutes, you have an SOP. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. This is getting good. Ladies Which is women. crazy though because... I'll say maybe 10 years ago in my career, I'm I'm known for writing SOPs from scratch. Like Crazy. I'm a writer. That's right. always been my thing. But now you have AI that can do it in seconds. So not only is that going to save you time, but it helps business owners amp up and get equipped so much faster. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about that because you brought up AI and there's kind of this interesting back and forth that's existing right now on the, um, you know, just in the business world and just on the internet in general, mm -hmm. because there are certain people that are um, excited for AI because they see it as a resource that provides additional leverage, right? Yeah. To your point, you essentially just say, hey, once upon a time, I had to sit down and do this thing from scratch. Now, yeah. you don't got to do that. We could just go ahead, chat, go hop on chat GPT, find a business that's similar to ours and create these SOPs and create these WIs through a program like that. Mm -hmm. For you as an HR specialist and mm -hmm. as a business consultant and a business strategist, mm -hmm. On the flip side, mm -hmm. you may have other people that say, okay, cool, Aren't wouldn't a BN the HR guy be fearful that a uh, program like, and I see you smirking already, so I, I already know where we're going to go with this, but yeah. that a chat GBT may be, I, I, for lack of a better term, would usurp the services or or what you do and, and, and what you provide as an HR specialist. To that, you would say what? So first off, when it comes to AI and all of these other tools, that's what they are. They're tools. So mm. you, if you think of a, a tool belt, that's one tool in your tool belt that you can pull. Right. AI can definitely produce this document in, in great seconds. But what it can't do is it doesn't have the experience that BA and the HR guy does to implement out. it. Yeah. You know, so I would never become obsolete to AI because not, okay, it has the information, but I have the experience to be able to execute it. And then I understand the, the psychology and the science behind working with people. Right. So if you have an SOP, in order to get someone to 
follow it and understand it, I also understand how that person learns. I also understand what role they play in the company, what strengths they have, what weaknesses they have. Mm -hmm. All of those things play a huge role in this whole mix that's called the business. Right. So again, I don't I don't become fearful that it's going to take anything away from me. If anything, it's just going to add to it. Love it. And it gives me more time to be in the trenches with the business owner on preparing them for that execution. Mm -hmm. But the preparation part, I get to kind of put that to the side so that I can focus more so on the execution. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Let's dive a little bit deeper into business strategy. I want to talk a little bit about business models, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you have a lot of entrepreneurs. I think there are typically, when we talk about business models, there are usually like three routes that most entrepreneurs go mm -hmm. when it comes to bringing people in, right? Yep. So you have one business model where you have entrepreneurs that strictly have W-2 workers, yeah. right? Individuals yep. that are on payroll and that are essentially helping them to fulfill the different uh, obligations in their business. Right. Then you have another business model where you have entrepreneurs that hire strictly contractors. Hey, listen, I'm not putting any y'all on payroll. We're going to mm -hmm. do this a la carte. I'm going to pay you, you know, as you're going ahead and providing whatever fulfillment on whatever services my business needs. Mm -hmm. And then you have a third business model where you have a bit of a hybrid situation, yeah. right? Where you have yeah. entrepreneurs that have like, you know, a couple of individuals that work in their business that are W-2, mm -hmm. a couple of other individuals that are contractors and they're, you know, hiring them as they need and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. As entrepreneurs, how can we go about identifying which business model makes the most sense for the kind of business that we are looking to build? What would you say to that? I think the first thing you do is understand what the, the, the final output of your business is involving. So if it's a digital product or if it's a business that operates in the complete digital space, then you really don't need a lot of physical bodies. So if you have a business that is fully automated and it can particularly operate off of it from itself, mm -hmm. then you just need someone that's going to oversee that. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is understand like the flow of your business, what type of business it is, and then you can start pretty much putting that, that structure in place of saying that, okay, if I'm going to, if I have a digital business, I'm going to have a VA. This VA is going to provide my administrative support. They're going to have operation back in. They're going to tap in with my community. All of those things. That person can be a contractor because if it's a VA, it's someone that's international. So you don't even really have to worry about anything. You're just pretty much negotiating the payment terms and making sure that they're executing accordingly. But when it comes to, I would say, a business that requires a little bit more in-depthness, so say, for example, let's just use the EYL, for example. There's so many components to that business makeup. Mm -hmm. There's different corridors to it. You have the learning element. You have the, the curriculum that has to be designed for live courses. You also then have back-end support for help desk. You then have a sales team. So there are so many different corridors that have to be covered. That requires more of an actual W-2 team. And for a W-2 employee, that's someone that you want exclusively to work for you. Right. Someone that you want to be in-house and that is you're going to be able to dictate what they do and how they do it. Now, for a lot of business owners, if you just hire contractors and you're okay with not having that complete control over what they do, then you can go the contractor route. But what I'm seeing in these in these different circles is a lot of people are bringing on contractors when they're really employees. Mm. So you have to understand the difference between the two. So for example, if I say this is my operations person, but they're a contractor, but they work a set schedule, you got them there Monday through Friday, they got to be there eight to five, they literally have a job description, and they're only working exclusively for you. That's that's the definition of an employee. That's a W-2. Mm -hmm. So I think you can structure your business any any way that best fits you, but you also have to understand the, the consequences of classifying a person correctly and then also the risk of misclassifying them as well. That's a really great point. I, I want to dive a little bit more into that because there are a lot of people that probably are making that mistake and they don't know it in terms mm -hmm. of having improper classification in their mm -hmm. business structure. You talked about one and well, a couple of different ones in regards to how that person is operating in, in your business. Are there any other things that can contribute to a potential misclassification? Like, I think I got a mm -hmm. contractor working in my business. Mm -hmm. Brandon Nelson comes in and be like, I got some bad news for you, buddy. It's, it's, uh, it's something else going on here based off of the way that this person is operating and providing fulfillment for your company. Mm -hmm. Are there any other key things that we could be able to look at that help us differentiate and know for sure? Like, I have a contractor and I know 
based on the way that this person is operating in my business, they are a contractor. I have a W-2 employee. Based on the way that they're operating in my business, I know that they are a, yeah. a, a W-2 employee. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah. So how I distinguish between the two for a contractor, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a bona fide contractor because I do, I provide business services for multiple clients. So that's mm. first tell all. You do a specific service for multiple clients. The service that you're contracting also should be something that you don't provide in your business in house. So a lot of business, a lot of business owners will, for example, you have sales internal and you have W two sales employees. But let's say it's seasonal. You gotta, you need to pick up a couple of more people. So, or you need more bodies. So you bring on additional salespeople. But you say, oh, those are contractors. Right. That's a misclassification mm -hmm. because you have sales in house. You can't classify that person as a contractor. Right. They're not a contractor. They're a temporary employee. Mm -hmm. So that's how you have to categorize it. So the person should have multiple clients providing a service that you don't provide inside your business. They also should have their own business insurance. So I have my own professional, my own pro professional and general liability insurance. And then I'm not exclusive to that particular individual. That person doesn't take, none of my clients tell me how to do anything. They come in and say, I need your help. I need you to provide HR infrastructure. I'm even someone's HR point of contact for anything in all HR. But they don't come to me and say, hey, I need you to discipline this person and I need you to write them up. I need you to do this. So as long as you're not the person that has the, the, the complete control in the situation, then you kind of know what the difference is between the two. So gotcha. if you're telling that employee what to do, they're, they're literally exclusive to you. They're working a set schedule. They're an employee, not a contractor. Got you. Um, this is getting good. Mm -hmm. You you are also talking about, you know, like you said, understanding where you want your business to go in terms of determining, okay, am I am I leaning more towards bringing in more W-2 workers versus mm -hmm. contractors? What are some of the, we understand the pros that come with going either way, depending on where you want to go as a business. Mm -hmm. What are some of the cons, right? Because obviously, even if you know as a business where you're going is going to require you to either have more contractors or have more W-2 workers, mm -hmm. it fits. There's still, there, nothing is 100% um lateral, right? Yeah. There are going to be some bumps and bruises that come along with it. There are still going to be some holes mm -hmm. that business owners need to be mindful of. From mm -hmm. your experiences working in HR, what are some of the cons that come with having businesses that lean more towards contractors? You talked about one already, which is lack of exclusivity, mm -hmm. right? Versus some of the cons that come with having a more W-2 favorable model. Talk a little bit about that. So I, before we decide which one we're going to have more of, I think the business owner first has to understand who they are and what their capacity is. Mm. So I would I would equate it to being a parent. Okay. You don't have children unless you know that you have the, the capacity to be able to take care of them. Mm -hmm. So as a business owner, you're not going to bring in W-2 employees if you're not going to be able to manage them. Facts. W-2 employees, are they have to be managed. They have to be given specific parameters so that they can get to the end goal that you set for them. With a contractor, you're bringing in a person that has expertise, you're giving them your problem, and they come in and they tackle it. It doesn't require hand-holding, and it, it's self-managed. So those would be the difference between the two there. But I'll say another con of having, let's say, more contractors than W-2s is you're bringing in someone who is used to doing things their way. They're, they're their own business owners. They're their own man, their own woman. So you're going to get that conflicting boss mentality. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen that time and time again where, you know, a, a business owner is asking their contractor to do something and the contractor says, nah, that's not the way to go. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, again, now we get this, this bumping of heads between these two individuals when if you had a W-2 employee, mm -hmm. that person would have probably acquiesced a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to understand you're, you're creating a, a structure or a culture, an environment, if you will, with these particular individuals. So how you classify them, you have to be ready to deal with what comes along with those territories. The biggest risk that most entrepreneurs take is trying to build a successful business without funding. But that risk is a reality for one out of every three entrepreneurs because their personal credit isn't where it needs to be in order for them to access that capital. Now, the truth is you can close the gap between where your business is versus where you want it to be by leveraging business credit. But if your personal credit report is poor, 99% of 
banks and lenders are going to deny you from doing so. And I should know, because a couple of years ago, I leveraged my personal credit report to get funding from Chase to start my company, and now that very same company, Take All Financial, is serving entrepreneurs just like you that are looking to restore their credit to get access to five to six figures in funding. So if you wanna go from risk to reward, click the link above or below this video to schedule your free consultation so that we can restore your credit and put you in position to access capital to build the business of your dreams. Let's dive a little bit deeper into that, right? Because we broke down mm -hmm. SOPs, we broke down WIs, we talked about some of the different business models that come with having a properly structured business, W-2s versus W-9s. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about hiring. Because this mm. is, look at, yeah, 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 yeah. See, look, he already, he had to take a seat back. He had to let it gasp <laughs> out. You okay. understand? It's, okay. a, it's, a, it's about to be one of them ones. Let's talk about yeah. it, man. I, like I said, I would be remiss yeah, if no, we didn't talk about it. Let's get into it. This is the dragon that every entrepreneur struggles with slaying. You mm -hmm. understand? Yeah. Finding talent, finding the right people. Mm hmm to to build this to build this business that we as entrepreneurs are looking to build. I don't care what you do. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're in trucking. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're in real estate. It doesn't matter if you're in healthcare, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. It's tough. It is very very tough. I want to be able to help people understand how to do it, when to do it, why they're going about doing it and avoiding a lot of the pitfalls that you and your several years of experience have seen mm -hmm. so that they can go ahead and make sure that they avoid that as well. So for start starters, let's get to the nitty-gritty of it, right? When do we as entrepreneurs know it's time for us to start looking into hiring? Let's let's start there and then kind of build from that. Got it. So when, of course, when you start to feel that tug, I would say, mm -hmm. I I can't do all of this by myself anymore. Right. You're trying to run the business. You're trying to strategize for the business. You're trying to coordinate and develop partnerships and collaborations with people. When you feel like that's starting to become overwhelming, then it's probably time for you to start spreading your wings and bringing on additional people. Mm -hmm. But I think before we start hiring, and this is where it starts to become difficult to bring on that talent, is you don't really know what your company is and who you're looking for. You know, I think when it comes to establishing your mission and your vision for your company, mm -hmm. those are tell-alls. Whenever I am hiring for a con for a client, that's what I'm leading with is I want you to know who you're going to come in to work for. That's how I'm going to be able to craft all of the different questions. But it's a lot of people who haven't really defined those things. And so it's hard for you to hire someone if you don't really have the answers to the questions that they're going to have. Mm -hmm. Or you're saying, OK, I'm overwhelmed. I need to bring in someone. OK, well, before we say you need to bring in someone, let's figure out what that person needs to do. Right. So when I meet with clients that feel like they're at that point, what we do is a complete brain dump. Of, I want to know exactly everything that you're doing. What is taking up most of your time so mm -hmm. we can compartmentalize those things? Let's start getting those tasks and putting them into a job description. Because it could be that, look, you just might need to organize yourself a little better. You may not need to hire someone. Right. Or if you're saying, I need to bring in this particular, this particular position, once we look through it and actually break down all of the tasks, it's like, well, no, you actually need an, a strong administrative assistant or a project manager. Right. You don't need all of these things. So I think when it comes to hiring, we don't do that due diligence first. And right. that could be one of the main reasons why we're not getting the talent that we, we do have, that mm -hmm. we need. And some people, they bring in talent. But because they don't know what they need, they have gems that are on their teams that they're not even tapping into what they can do. Because mm. you brought someone in for customer service, but this person can literally be running your entire back end. They have knowledge of systems right. and different integrations and automations, but you don't know that because you didn't do your due diligence when you interviewed that person. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's you got to do your homework as a business owner. That's how you're going to get that desired in is knowing what you're doing and starting out that process right. I'll give you a great I'll give you a great example of my own company. I remember when I first started my current company, Take All Financial, we had mm -hmm. an individual that we brought in and he was interviewing for our sales, one of our sales positions. Mm -hmm. Great guy. Came in um, to come and do in sales. And for the first like month and a half, he was okay, mm -hmm. but he wasn't necessarily stellar. Mm -hmm. However, the longer me and my partner kind of like was monitoring his behavior, and we also had another position in our operations staff that yeah. we needed filled. And we kind of were just looking at a lot of, you know, his qualities and the traits that he brought to the team. It was like, I think he would be better here yeah. in operations versus here in sales, right? Yeah. We've moved him over to our operations team. He has been like the 
head honcho. I'm talking about employee of the month every month. Yeah. Never misses a day, always punctual, and is like setting the tone literally each and every single day for what we look for in that department. Like he, he's, he's that guy, essentially, yeah. right? But once again, it goes back to your point. These are the key things that us as entrepreneurs aren't seeing, right? Some of us are either hiring too early. Some of us are hiring too late. Some of us are mishiring to the mm -hmm. point that you just made to where we have this person here and they're really, their talent and their gifts really can serve other aspects of our business. Mm -hmm. So let's dive a little bit more into that then, right? We understand now when to hire, right? And making sure we do our due diligence before to make sure we're not pre-hiring or, or hiring too late. Mm -hmm. How do we go about hire, going about bringing individuals into our business the right way? What's the step-by-step -step blueprint that you would lay out for individuals that are watching this episode? Got it. So I would say if you're going to consider hiring, let's do our homework first, making sure that we understand the business that we're bringing them into. We have clearly defined job roles for that person. The job description is clear. Mm -hmm. you're, you have all of the, the different responsibilities laid out. Mm -hmm. Then it's about making sure that you have an appealing job ad. You know, when you're looking for somebody, you don't want to just say, hey, we hiring, hit my DMs if, if you want to do that. <laughs> I get it. But right. listen, like, hey, I'm a seven-figure business that is changing the world right now. If you want to impact culture, make sure that you tap in with us. We have life-changing employment experiences. We not only bring in employees, but we're, we're teaching you how to change your life. Mm -hmm. Like, I would be more enthused to apply for a job that gave me that type of description versus I'm looking for a salesperson, hit my DM. So it's all about the way that you position the the, the actual opportunity. Mm -hmm. So not only crafting a good job ad, but then understanding where you're shopping for this talent. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to be found in the same place. If you're looking for a premium employee, you're probably going to look in a premium location, you know, more of like a LinkedIn, or you might even tap in with a headhunter. If you're looking for more of like your average day to day, you might be able to put that on social media, or you might even be able to put it on Craigslist. But you have to understand the channel that you're looking for these people through. Mm -hmm. And then once you do have the job posted, you have candidates, start looking through the the applications, the resumes that you're receiving, just kind of seeing what red flags could pop up, mm -hmm. making sure that people have consistent job history, making sure that the experience that they have listed on the document is relevant to what you're looking for. Then screen that person, have an interview with them. Don't just ask surface level questions to the point of you saying that you hired someone for sales, but they are excelling in operations. I would ask them, what other talents do you have that are not listed on your resume? You know, what are your career aspirations? Give me your personal, your professional and your, um, you know, your, your cash goals or your financial goals for one to three years. That way you have a clear understanding of what this person is looking to do. You know that they're looking to grow. So you really can meet that person where they are. Mm -hmm. And then before you extend a job offer to this person, let's say we go through the interview, you need to know what you're going to pay them. Like looking at this is the position that I'm hiring for. This is what the market is paying. This is what I'm paying as part of my company's philosophy and then extend the job offer. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a professional offer letter that's written. It has all of the details. And then once you get that person having accepted that offer, then you onboard them. Mm -hmm. Onboarding is a whole different beast. But I would say that's a good, clear path to hiring somebody the right way. I love it. You mentioned a couple of resources. You talked about Headhunter. You talked about LinkedIn. Um, you also, surprisingly, I've never heard anyone mention Craigslist, but that is a resource in and of itself. Uh -huh. Are there any other resources that other entrepreneurs could look into when it comes to hiring outside of those? Or is that essentially like your big three, big four? I would say you also can look on Indeed. I think okay. a lot of us slip, we we slip, we sleep on Indeed, but I like it because you can not only upload your resume, but you can also search the different opportunities that are there. Because Indeed and Monster are, I would say, like the the typical ones that everyone are familiar with, mm. I would always post there because you can always have, I would say, just a a nice pile to go through that you can kind of start seeing and assessing if, if that's the kind of talent you want. Got you. This is going to be a bit of a loaded question, but I have to ask. Mm -hmm. you've, you're you someone that had, I mean, you've gone through the hiring process more times than I could probably count, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's made he flared his eyebrows up. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a bit, <laughs> right? Um, the owner of Milano de Rouge, uh, Milan Harris, she has a really mm -hmm. cool quote that she shared that I, I resonated with. She said, mm -hmm. hiring is guessing, firing is knowing. 
right? Mm. Yeah, I, I really, really love that quote. So my question for you is, and like I said, it's a bit of a loaded question. It might be a bit tricky, but even though, of course, you're essentially helping business owners fill positions for operations and sales and all these other different um, aspects of their business, in that interview process, has there ever been a key component or a key trait um, that you've seen in a majority, because it's never going to be 100% across the yeah. board, but just a majority of the candidates throughout your years of working in HR to where it's either like, okay, this person more than likely is going to be a good fit and you turned out to be right about it, or on the flip side to where it's like, okay, this person is qualified, but this one thing here is letting me know that I'm not 100% sure that they're going to be a, a long-term fit or a good fit here, and you were right about that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there was ever one key component there, if you could think of one. Um, so I'll say this, in my HR experience and, you know, the decade plus of interviewing and engaging with a lot of different candidates, I've grown to not take the interview as the tell-all. Mm. And the reason for that is because people can be professional interviewers. <laughs> there are people that are great with their words. Facts. You know, you can say, Facts. you can say the right things. Yes. For example, for me, if I'm interviewing for a job, which... I'm not doing that anymore. But right. if I'm interviewing for a, a job, I've never had to prepare for that interview mm -hmm. in terms of how I'm going to answer the questions. Right. What I prepare for is more of understanding the company right. and, the, and being able to dissect that. Mm -hmm. But if a person is a really good people person, they're warm, they're genuine, they can connect with the interviewer, then that's already going to be a, a good gateway into a position or an opportunity. Right. But what I'm looking for is the performance and how that person shows up, mm -hmm. which is why it's so important for companies that are at will and at will states that you exercise that right. Mm -hmm. Because there are people that are going to do the whole bait and switch. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to be the best possible person in the interview and they don't show up that way as an employee. And you immediately are going to be able to eliminate that if you exercise your at will status gotcha, gotcha. so yeah I, interviews are great and i always use those as a first first line of defense but you gotta you gotta get into the actual trenches and see how that person shows up gotcha 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 very 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 good point there let's talk let's transition now to payroll let's talk mm -hmm. payroll right mm -hmm. everybody's a boss till the invoice comes but hey listen it's a yep. It's a part of business, right? We're not just going to hire people and not be able to take care of them. We got to we have to pay our pay our workers, make sure yeah. we're taking care of our individuals. You made a key point earlier that I wanted to circle back to where you were talking about how, you know, once we bring these individuals in, making sure they're getting paid appropriately. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that right now have employees in their company and they're either either overpaying them or mm -hmm. underpaying them and they have no idea. Right. Right? Right. Talk a little bit about that. If I'm an entrepreneur, if I'm a business owner, how can I go about what are the steps that I need to take to ensure that either before or when I'm getting ready to bring somebody in, I'm paying them the exact amount that I'm supposed to be paying them to ensure that they're getting compensated fairly and appropriately and I'm not either putting a hole in my pocket or I'm not spending as much I'm not spending as much as I actually should be spending to retain this employee. Gotcha. So what I like to do is pull national survey national salary surveys. Because that's giving me information across the board on what companies of a certain size mm. are paying. Right. And what I'll do is I will take that information, which is a sample, and I'm going to show that to my client. Because it's the specific company size, the same type of industry. And, you know, it kind of gives them an idea of, hey, this is in this particular region. This is what this company is paying. Let's identify what's going to be comfortable for you and create a range. So at the minimum level, this is at the lowest end that we're going to pay. We have a mid for people that are coming in with a bit more experience. But if we have someone that we really want to get in, this is the max that we're going to pay. So I would establish that particular pay band is what I call it. So okay. it gives you your, your entire kind of leeway of what you can pay someone. Right. And then we're then going to go to the drawing board of seeing what this person is asking for and seeing how they fit within that range. But we also can work backwards too, because mm -hmm. I've had clients that are already paying individuals and nothing was structured, et cetera. So we were able to then put a pay band together and then put that person into that pay band. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's resulted in having the pay adjusted where it actually is a little less but we were able to kind of make up for it with additional perks and benefits. So it's all about understanding what your company threshold is and where you should be paying fairly, but then also being able to have a, a total compensation mindset of saying that from a total value perspective, you're still good and mm -hmm. I'm keeping you whole, but your, you know, your, your dollar value of your salary may have slightly changed, 
But it's important to have those things established in the beginning because if you do change someone's pay, it's an opportunity for them to be disappointed. It can right. impact the performance, which can impact the culture of the company and all of those things. It could be a, a you know a snowball effect. Right. Got you. When we talk about payroll, another aspect of it, once again, and this is the unsexy side of business, are payroll taxes, mm -hmm. right? So as my question for that is, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a uh, employees that, if, if my business is based in one state, mm -hmm. but I have employees that are based in other states, mm -hmm. how does payroll work there? More specifically, how do payroll taxes get affected in that regard? So that is really important when it comes to being a multi-state employer. Mm. You are responsible as an employee. You're responsible for the the taxes for the state in which your employee is working from. Mm. So let's say, for example, I have clients that are in Georgia, but if they have employees that are working in California, they now are have to be compliant with California's employer taxes. Mm. And so that's going to require you to have to set up payroll tax accounts so that you're withholding all of the amounts for that particular state. So this goes back to the infrastructure setup. Right. When I meet with a client, those are all of the things I want to explore with them so that they understand what type of things they're going to be responsible for. Right. That could be a lot. Right. When it comes to, especially with California, there are certain states that the taxation is just crazy. Right. So being responsible for that may be a little bit more than they're ready to do at that point. So it's important to know what you're responsible for before you just jump head first into it. Got you. Are there any resources that assist with you? mentioned one earlier, the National Something Survey. What, what was So it? that's the National Salary Survey. That really just gives you what each company is paying in different regions. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to setting up your taxes for each of the states that you have employees in, your payroll providers are, are now offering that. Mm -hmm. This is starting to become a lot more of a prevalent issue, especially during COVID, where we had a, a really large influx of people working from home and people were starting to telecommute and moving to different states and such. Mm -hmm. So now payroll providers are offering that as a service. So when you are setting up your particular payroll, your payroll account, mm -hmm. you're going to enter that employee's address and then it's going to pull up and say, okay, you need to make sure that you have tax accounts set up for California. You have an employee in Pennsylvania, New York, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then it takes you through the steps to set that up. Family, listen, you could have saw this interview early and ad free if you became a member of my Patreon. Not only that, but you could have also saw behind the scenes footage that's only available to my Patreon community. So what are you waiting for? Listen, head over to patreon.com forward slash the Marvin Francois show for early and ad free content on all things credit, real estate, trucking, Turo, you name it, we got it. That's patreon.com forward slash the Marvin Francois show. But back to the interview. One thing that you've referenced a couple of times throughout this sit down mm -hmm. is you've talked about company culture, mm -hmm. company culture, mission, values, mission and values, things of that nature. I want to dive more into that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know in all your years of, you know, being it, well, first of all, before we dive into that, to provide some context. I think when I when I normally hear about company culture, there's usually three key terms out of here, which is mission, values, and then vision, mm -hmm. right? And I, myself, I think I have a solid understanding of like mission and value and visions and how that directly correlates with business. I'm curious to know what you would define each of those respective terms as, just to help provide context for the audience as well. Got you. So whenever I talk about culture, I use the acronym MVVP. So that's mission, vision, values, and people because mm -hmm. that is really what culture is. Okay. So when I think of a mission, it defines, it's a statement that defines the purpose of your company. Okay. Why are you in existence? What are you here for? You can call the mission your why. And then when it comes to your vision, that is describing a future state of what you want to accomplish for your business. And then when it comes to core values, those are descriptives that should describe the characteristics, the 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 personality of every person in your company from leadership down. Mm. So when you think of a company, you think of, let's say, if you think of Google, mm. like some of the core values that I can associate with a company like that would be innovation, right? Of uh, agile, mm -hmm. um, flexible. You know, they're they're trendy, etc. So whenever you have core values for a company, this goes back to your hiring. When you're hiring people, you want to hire people that have the same core values as you right. because that's what they're going to exude in everyday life of your company. Right. And those are things that you also, that you should also see in your, your leadership. So, for example, when I worked with um, Marcus right when we were getting ready to do 
the Earn Your Leisure and Recession Proof merge, one thing we did is we went through and we established the mission, the vision, and the core values. And so he's like, yeah, core values. And you know, I gave him like, I want people, if you had to describe what your business is, give me those words. And so that's how we were able to develop it. So we have service, we have hustle, we have, you know, um, servitude and like different things of that nature. But it's really making sure that, hey, if I say these are the core values, when I look at it, I should be able to see that. Mm -hmm. Like that's what sets your company apart. There's a distinctiveness about it. Mm -hmm. And then that also just plays into your culture. Mm -hmm. Like that's really how you establish culture. But if you've never set set down to actually put all of those things into play and write them out mm -hmm. and actually share them with people, you don't have a culture. Right. You literally are just existing and hoping people catch on. Right. You're winging it. Essentially. Yeah. You're winging it. <laughs> you're, you're winging, winging it, it. For lack of a better term. Okay. So I'm curious. So then from there, I, that also makes me curious. You know, you know, in all your years of working in this space, have you ever seen a common theme when mm -hmm. it's come to company culture that has existed within a lot of the successful business that, businesses that you've worked with and that you've serviced? Yeah. Um, I would say a, a core value that I've seen within culture has always been a focus on taking care of the people. Mm. If your business is people focused and there's a family element to it, mm. those are the ones that win. Mm. I worked for a dental manufacturing company for 10 years before I went on to, you know, work in other industries, but this company was huge on just the family environment. There's so many things that this company went above and beyond to do for their employees that made it a family environment. People actually felt comfortable coming to work. Mm -hmm. I see the same thing with EYL and Recession Proof. It's all about family and it's all about servicing and adding value to others. So I feel like if your business is built around that, those are the ones that people want to support because it's not all about what you can get, but it's what you're giving to others. Mm. Is there ever a situation, have you ever seen a situation where, because as time progresses, the company grows and things change, things move around. Sometimes mm -hmm. there can be a bit of a, I don't necessarily want to call it a pivot, but a shift. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a situation where in a lot of these successful companies that you work with, whether it's happened on a quarterly basis, on like a on an every six month basis, on every year basis, where there's a revisiting of the company culture to where mm -hmm. it's like, hey, we gotta, we actually have to change some things around here because mm -hmm. we're what we thought our mission was and what we thought our values were back two, three years ago is not the same for where we are now, where we're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been some situation like that? Oh, that happens often. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a so for me, I'm big on having annual, I, would, I call them my client retreats. Mm -hmm. But during that time, we're kind of doing a diagnostic of the okay. business. We're pulling things apart, lifting up the hood to see what's working, what we might want to change. Mm -hmm. But I would say with all of the things that you just described, that's all under the, the concept of change management, which mm -hmm. is also a huge HR function. Mm -hmm. We manage the changes within the business. Mm -hmm. The biggest or the, the best practice for handling change is making sure that you communicate it and be transparent about it. Mm. So let's say if we do need to pivot and there's some things about the culture that we want to change. So for example, when I worked in cannabis, we provided free lunch to everyone. It was fully catered every day. And that was something that people came to love, it, but we had to figure out like, hey, this is starting to become a little costly. We're going to scale back a little bit. We're still going to offer something, but it's going to be different. Right. So we had what we say quarterly town hall meetings. So during that town hall, we brought that up. Like, hey, family meeting, just want to let you guys know we're not doing full-on meal services anymore, but we are doing these different a la carte. There'll be sandwiches. There'll be different things for you still to be able to consume on a daily basis. You don't have to worry about lunch, but it's not going to be the full catered meal that you're used to. And the reason for that is because we're scaling back, because we're going to use those funds, because it's going to contribute to a new build out that we're going to have, which is going to, we're going to allow you to be able to not only invest in this particular endeavor, but it's going to be more career opportunities for you. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just about communicating it, but those changes are going to come. Like, And you have to be ready to pivot, but communicate to your team so that it's just not a shell shock. Gotcha. Gotcha. I want to talk also about something. You said something. I, I fell in love with it when I heard it. You posted it on your uh, social. Mm -hmm. Sustainability versus scalability. Mm. That was, man, I, mm -hmm. I, would, I really want to talk about that because once again, because of this time, time and age that we're living in, everybody's like, how do I get to seven figures? How do I get to eight figures? I want to make a hundred thousand in a hundred days. Mm -hmm. I want to make my first million in you know, a month and all these other different things. 
Um, and you talked a little bit about as entrepreneurs kind of knowing what season of business that you're in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, the term sustainability may have a bit of a negative context because if I'm sustaining, I'm not, that means I'm not growing. Yeah. Right. And yeah. as entrepreneurs, we think we always have to be going, going, going. And there's never going to be a season where we have to take two steps back so that we can set ourselves up, mm -hmm. right? To take those five steps forward. Could you talk a little bit about that? The difference between sustainability versus scalability for the people that are listening right now? Yeah. So I think one of the reasons why I did that post is because I hear that term scaling, scaling, scaling yeah. a lot in right. the entrepreneurial community. And I do think it's great and you should aspire to do that. But I think we can also do ourselves a disservice by not understanding what it means to scale. Right. And so by scaling, that means that you have already achieved a certain amount of success in your business. And you're now taking that platform or that foundation and you're growing it and you're expanding upon something. There's a lot of entrepreneurs out here that haven't developed a foundation. Like right. you don't have a set core to stand on to scale anything. Right. So when it comes to being able to scale, you have to be able to sustain it. Because mm -hmm. if you look at it, the the business is the, the launching pad. Mm -hmm. In order to scale, you're going to be able to go upward. But mm -hmm. if there's nothing on the bottom of that, what are you going to bounce off of? What are you going to land back on? There's no foundation there. Right. So that's why I put that post of really understanding what it is that you're doing. And a lot of people are confusing. Oh, I'm scaling. I'm scaling. No, you're building. You're going to build first. Mm -hmm. You're going to have that stable foundation. And then we're going to be able to scale. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Let's talk about another aspect of business as well. You know, because once again, we want to build a successful business, mm -hmm. right? And we need to make sure that everything on from on from the behind the scenes and on the back end is taken care of from top to bottom. We've talked about understanding people, culture, payroll, um, business models, SOPs, WIs, the whole nine. Um, I want to talk about another one that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, even myself to a certain degree, at times has overlooked. Mm -hmm. Let's talk compliance, because I feel like compliance is also a very big one, mm -hmm. because to call it to call it what it is there are a lot of business owners right now who are operating their business and have no idea that they are running their business businesses illegitimately and they think everything is peaches and cream yeah. right um but at the same time over the course of the past couple of years i'm not sure about yourself but i'll speak for myself i've definitely seen a bit of an uptick in some some individuals who have businesses who have gotten a bit of hot water whether it's with the ftc whether it's with the cfpb or the elemental whatever acronyms you want to use <laughs> Right. Whatever acronym, e the element, whatever it may be, right? I don't want to just give people the resources and the information they need, whether it's to sustain or to scale, right? The name of the game is not just to get in business. We want to stay in business. Absolutely. Right? And compliance Absolutely. plays a very huge role of that. From your experience, what are some of the biggest mistakes that most entrepreneurs have made when it's come to compliance? Has it been connected to business insurance? Has it been connected to taxes, mm -hmm. payroll? Has it been connected to not having the right business model? Talk a little bit about that. Um, I would say a little bit of all of the above. Okay. One of the the probably the most popular one that I've seen has been the classification okay. of employee versus contractor. Mm -hmm. But then I also see a, a huge and one of the things I like to do is just the, the gap analysis of hey, what what are we missing here? Mm -hmm. But I see a lot of business owners that don't have business insurance. And so I tell them, you know, that's the same. Same thing of you going and you purchasing an exotic car mm -hmm. and you riding around is beautiful, but it's not insured. And someone hits you, who's going to pay for that? Mm. That's literally the same thing for your business. If you're out here, you're thriving, you have all of this revenue and someone sues you and you don't have professional or general liability insurance, mm -hmm. that's coming out of your pocket as opposed to it being a deductible. Mm. And then I also see people who have employees W-2 employees, but they don't have workers' comp insurance, specifically Yeesh. if your state requires that. You know, so you have employees that are, are working on behalf of your business and they they incur an injury in your place of business, even if it's virtually. Wow. Even if you have someone that telecommutes and they are your help desk, they're on the computer all day. If that person gets carpal tunnel working for your business, who you think going to get that bill? Really? Yeah. We were okay. Let me see yeah. that. Let me see that. Hold on. This yeah. So that's that's why it's important to have workers' comp coverage mm -hmm. because again, you're covered and it's gonna be able to provide whatever treatment is necessary for that employee of, for that workplace injury that they incurred. Gotcha. Another, I would say, compliance issue that I'm seeing for people is just how the business is structured when it comes to, you know, them having 
again, all of their employees in one bucket of saying, oh, okay, we have W-2s, but they, they're not set up properly because they're all working in different states and they don't have all of those different tax accounts set up. So they're not doing proper withholdings. And that's where it can get very costly because Uncle Sam is going to get his money either way. Oh, yeah. And so that's sure. when we get into the back taxes and the penalties and such. So I've seen a lot of that. And it's because people are moving fast. You know, that's what we right. preach. It's like success loves speed. Get out there and do it. Hire some people. Go get your LLC. Right. Go start making this money. Get products. Get digital courses. All of that stuff. But it's like, okay, let's let's go through the checklist and just make sure it's done right. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you to slow down. Bring someone in that can keep up with your speed and keep it moving. Right, right. Talk. A I want to talk a little bit more about the business insurance side because in my space, in, I'm in the credit space, mm -hmm. and in my space, business insurance is technically considered uh, surety bonds, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how it varies because you've worked in a lot of different industries mm -hmm. from cannabis and beyond. How does business insurance vary from industry to industry? Talk to me a little bit about it's that. It's going to be very different depending on your industry. Gotcha. Um, and especially, I wouldn't tell them that I work in credit, you know? I, I would oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, clearly. You know, I know but I, know. I mean, but so, I know, I know. but for different industries, right. it, it's going to differ and it's going to, they're going to give you a, a risk factor. Mm. And so depending on the type of business or the industry that you're engaged in, they're going to go through a complete audit of what it's going to take to insure you. A good way so that you get the best possible premium for yourself is having the different safeguards in place. So they want to know, you know, how are you protecting your clients? Like, you know, if you do have confidential information, what's the likelihood of there being a breach of that information? And just making sure you have all your systems and those safeguards in place right. so that when you do apply for that insurance, you're showing them, I got all of this stuff, so you don't have to worry about that. And so then they're like, okay, this person has already assessed risk, so they're not a risk to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to charge them that premium price for insurance. Come on now. Listen, let me tell you something. Once we finish this interview, I got some phone calls to make. I got some emails <laughs> to send. I thought I was doing business right, ladies and gentlemen. I just got, I just got a master class. My guy, listen. I know we have to get you out of here. First and foremost, thank you so much for coming on my platform my and just and blessing my audience and providing the value that you provided. Before we get you out of here, of course, I want you to, of course, take a second to let people know where they can find you. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, just if you could leave just some closing words for any entrepreneurs that are watching this um, mm -hmm. right now, whether it be words of encouragement, words of guidance, mm -hmm. words of mo whatever you feel best suits this present moment in time, do that. The camera is yours right here. You can take us away. Yeah. So being the HR guy, you can follow me on Instagram, BN underscore the HR guy. Mm. You can also visit my website, beinthehrguy.com. All of the information that I provide on a daily basis is really for the education of business owners. It's my mission to make sure that our people are not only able to do business without boundaries, but to do business correctly so that you're set up for success so that we have longevity and that we're able to leave legacies for our family. When it comes to setting up or starting your own business, we definitely want you to do it. But remember, we want you to do it right. Mm -hmm. There you go. Be in the HR guy, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, if you haven't already, what are you doing? Take a second, take a minute, take an hour out of your day right here, right now to just go ahead, slap the like button, leave a review and show this episode some love. I'm very appreciative for each and every single one of you. Even more appreciative for you, like I said, for coming on and giving the game on top of game on top of game. But as always, you guys, this is the Marvin Francois Show. I'm your host, Marvin Francois. Y'all have been good. We've been great. This has been amazing. And as always, thank y'all and God bless. Peace.